Πιστεύω ότι πρέπει έτσι να γίνει εδώ. I have no problem going first. I'm doing it all the time, but I'm just a translator. <laughs> Is, is it possible to scoot down this way a little bit? Is it possible to scoot down a little bit this way? Yeah. 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 Yeah, but I don't know if I'm going to do Okay, that works. All right, so we're going to start. Um, I'm going to try to just, um, I wrote down some, some notes, but I'm going to try to um, read through this more quickly since um, there's less time than I, than I thought we would have. Um, in, in Occupy Oakland, and I think this is true of Occupy in general, self-organization uh, developed along two distinct tracks um, or two different um, forms that self-organization took. Uh, in, in the first place, there was the Occupy camp itself, whose formal and informal committees provided food, shelter, safety, uh, and, and medical care. There were libraries and child care services, information kiosks, and medic tents. The distinguishing feature of this organizing was that, in many regards, it was oriented toward meeting people's fundamental, we might even say bodily, needs. Especially at first, much of this work was spontaneous and uncoordinated. People saw something that needed to be done, and they did it without asking for permission. There was much duplication of effort, confusion, and opacity. In those early days, I spent much of my time running around the camp looking for someone in order to put them in touch with someone else so that they could work on some common project. So, you know, you spend a lot of time being like, do you know the person who's doing that? And I'd be like, yeah, I think I know that person. And I would, you know, try to run around and look for them. Um, uh, then, then the other space of self-organization was the space of the General Assembly, where people came together to congregate, talk, listen, share ideas, debate, resolve disputes, uh, and decide upon action in common. I refer to this as a space, but it's not the same kind of space as the camp. The General Assembly could really take place anywhere, anywhere that you know people decided to, to congregate and, and make an assembly. Obviously, these two types of spaces were, um, were uh, dependent on each other. They were indissoluble. Um, without the camp, the assembly would lose much of its purpose, its content. Um, it would become purely ethereal, a space of empty decision, a power founded on nothing. Uh, but without the assembly, the camp would have lacked an efficient means for information sharing, for open discussion. I think it's notable that in, recent, in the recent political sequence, the one we're discussing here this weekend, um, many square occupations do not feature assemblies or formal assemblies of any sort. Um, from what I understand, uh, they didn't happen in Tahrir or, or in uh, Gezi Park. Uh, and so perhaps the assembly is not at all indispensable. And yet I think there's a reason why again and again, I mean since the time of the French Revolution and arguably even before, people choose the form of the assembly as a way to share ideas, to discuss and debate, um, and to resolve disputes. <laughs> Uh, in another essay that I've written about Occupy, I argued that these two poles of self-organization attracted um, different class fractions and mobilized very different strategic perspectives. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, as we know, um, the camp attracted uh, 
the most destitute populations for whom it was a space of refuge, uh, a way to organize for their own needs beyond the indignities of charity uh, and welfare. These folks were politicized and radicalized by the practical everyday communism uh, of the camp, its principles of free giving and non-hierarchy. The assemblies, however, attracted a much more middle-class fraction, and this is part of the, the, the argument that I make about Occupy, um, what I have called a proletarianized middle class, people who identified with the inclusive, abstract universality of the assembly uh, and its attendant notion of the 99%. The success of the Occupy movement in general, I would argue, depended on the encounter uh, of these different fractions. Sometimes it was driven forward by the sense of common purpose, uh, of a shared sense of dispossession that these two um, you know, fractions uh, found. Uh, but it was also driven forward by the rifts and contradictions that opened between these groups. And I think in many places, you know, a lot of the kind of middle class activist layer simply kind of abandoned a lot of the uh, homeless and poor people who were in the camps. They, you know, didn't any longer want to kind of organize uh, in common with, with, with these folks because there were often very different kinds of politics um, that, that people had. Um, you know, so and I've, I've argued that the, the camp form uh, was the real truth of the movement, um, and that you know the camp was the foundation for a process of, of self-organization that could have survived um, only if it had been able to expand into workplaces and neighborhoods uh, to begin to appropriate from capital and the state the resources people needed to truly meet their own needs. So it was the truth, but I, I don't think it was the truth of the movement, but I don't think it was sustainable um, within these kinds of little squares. I mean, it was, it was in, that, in that form, fundamentally miserable. Um, and I think, you know, I see, I see um, George Kefensis here, and, and he was one of the first people to kind of recognize the, this fact of it, that, the, that these, these in, in a very early piece that he wrote about it, that these camps were really not sustainable, um, and they were breaking down um, in, internally from their own contradictions. And, you know, the kind of police attacks on the movement um, were, you know, sort of um, part of the destruction of the movement, but there were, there were real sort of internal uh, problems that made it unsustainable. So today I just wanted to talk about the assemblies because in you know, the other piece it seemed like I was saying, well the assemblies are, are simply superficial and I don't think that that's true. Um, you know, I think that, that they were very important um, and I want to, to indicate the ways that, th that they were important but also the ways that they have failed and eventually became oppressive and, and even counter-revolutionary spaces and then I want to kind of finish with a couple of thoughts about how we might um, relate to assemblies in the future because you know even though I, I hear some people who seem to speak as if they think it's possible that we could get beyond assemblies I don't think that's really going to happen people are going to continue to kind of meet in this form and they're going to continue to work with that there's some kind of fundamental um, desire that is mobilized in the form of the assembly um, but I think that we will also continue to to encounter similar um, problems um, <clears throat> In, in uh, you know, the, the, I think it's hard to speak generally about what an assembly is. That there's lots of different types of them. They're historically uh, served different purposes. Um, you know, it's it's this moment when a uh, kind of constituent body um, declares itself in opposition to some existing power, and and you know, and and can even kind of dissolve that power and, and negate it. And I think. Um, in, in Oakland, we saw that in a, in a couple of times um, where you could really see that kind of power of the assembly to, um, to negate existing standing powers. The, the, the assembly in Oakland was right in front of City Hall. Um, and so it was very much a kind of challenge to the authority of the city. And very early on, I think on maybe the first or second day, the mayor came uh, and she wanted to speak to the assembly. Um, you know, she wanted to be able to give a kind of address um, because and I think, and this happened in many places, she's a Democrat, she has a kind of activist background, a social movement background, and she was interested in domesticating the camp to her particular political projects. And people were not sure what to do. Some people wanted to kick her out immediately and tell her that she had to leave. Other people wanted to let her speak. Um, and finally, the facilitators just decided that she could speak, um, but she had to wait in line with everybody else. And she could only you know, speak for two or three minutes like everybody else. And she couldn't speak um, as a politician. She couldn't speak as kind of Mayor Kwan. She could only uh, you know, address the assembly as Citizen Kwan, as it were. Um, 
And she left, you know, because she was there as a mayor, not as a person. And um, so, you know, and then eventually a couple weeks later after she kind of realized that we were not going to be domesticated um, and after kind of relations really broke down and they decided that they were going to raid the camp and this, you know, with this dramatic kind of military style raid, um, they begin to kind of uh, go through the camp uh, dispensing little leaflets, sort of like the leaflets that they drop on cities before they drop bombs to like, you know, tell you, hey, we're coming, it's your fault. Um, so they, they uh, went through the camp and, you know, uh, passing out these little leaflets detailing the, the many violations that the, the camp featured, you know, open flame and sanitation problems, all these kinds of things that we were violating these laws and that's why they were going to um, come shoot tear gas at us. And uh, so... The, uh, the assembly read the letter and, you know, decided whether they wanted to honor uh, the demands. Um, and, of course, nobody wanted to and, you know, uh, unanimously rejected it. And then, you know, after they rejected it, people lit the, the letter on fire and then the kind of assembly dissolved into a, a dance party, as was often um, the case. At least that's how I remember it. I'm, it may be a screen memory. But, um, you know, I think that that, again... Uh, you know, symbolizes the, the, the power of the assembly to kind of negate existing authorities, right? I mean, it's, and there's something really amazing um, about these moments when you can see a kind of um, unanimous, unequivocal negation. Um, and uh, there's something satisfyingly absolute about, about these moments when the political class is told to go fuck itself. Um, and I think that, you know, that's obviously one of the real values to uh, the assembly. But I think also once you have sort of, um, you know, mechanisms for decision like this, the, the assemblies also open themselves up to being spaces of recuperation. I mean, there's a reason why, why Mayor Kwan came to the assembly. You know, she came there because she saw it as a space that was open to recuperation. And in many places uh, in the U.S., the, 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 the assemblies were domesticated quite quickly. They were made into kind of appendages of local kind of political campaigns and opportunist activists um, who figured out how to kind of manipulate the different procedures and, 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 and control them. Um, and from what I hear, like, they often became pretty toxic spaces. And that, that in part has to do, um, you know, with, with the assembly becoming a, a, a space of decision. Um, now, I'm not going to say that, that, that uh, assemblies shouldn't be spaces of decision. Obviously, there are moments where decisions must be made and moreover will be made, whether, you know, whether formally or not. Sometimes you, know, it, it, you, can, you can defer a decision, but still a decision is going to be made. Um, this is especially the case when money is involved. Um, I think this is a very, uh, uh, you know, a big issue um, when you have funds, you know, uh, you're going to want to decide openly and transparently how those funds are spent. And it's, it's a good argument for thinking seriously about whether you want funds in the name of the movement, because that creates all kinds of problems. Um, but, I, but what I am going to do is I'm going to recommend um, that we reconceptualize what it is that assemblies do when they make decisions. There are many functions that assemblies are called upon to perform that need not take the form of the decision and are in fact often greatly harmed when assemblies try to affect them through decision-making processes. At a fundamental level, the power of the assemblies in Oakland and from what I can gather elsewhere in the U.S. had nothing to do with decision-making. Uh, it had to do with the opportunities that allowed people to talk about their grievances, their hopes, <coughs> their experiences. For many people, especially those unaccustomed to addressing crowds, this was the most important part of the Occupy experience. Uh, in a country marked by studious indifference to the experience of others, to the massive suffering, the lives of quiet desperation, uh, outpourings like this are something of a revelation. Everyone I knew was moved by what they felt was a spontaneous alignment of perspective or organic consensus about what was wrong with the world we lived in. I mean, I just think back to the early days of the kind of assemblies and hearing people, you know, one after the other get up and, and speak, and you knew that they were saying something that they hadn't really said before, or hadn't really said in this way in front of people, and you could feel this kind of convergence of sentiment. And, you know, that's what... Um, you know, that's, that's what this is really about. And I, you know, I mean, for me, there's all these other really powerful moments, you know, blockading the port, you know, nights of rioting, uh, amazing things that happened uh, in the course of Occupy. But I want to honor that for many people all over the country, this is what it was about. It was about just getting the chance to, to talk and to listen. Um, and so 
Um, but what I saw in Oakland was that over time, these spaces for expression, discussion, information sharing, conversation, were increasingly turned into spaces of decision. Uh, in, in my view, many of these proposals that were, had to be decided upon had no business taking the form of the decision. The assemblies concerned themselves with decisions on matters for which there was obviously already unanimity, uh, proposals to draft statements of solidarity with you know, the struggle in Syria or something like that, which you know, it was just given that people could have gone out and written a letter uh, in the name of the movement and it would have been quite fine. Um, you know, and it seemed that sometimes there was this desire to make a decision to kind of just affirm the abstract <laughs> unity of people together. Like, that's what held us together, the fact that we could all just, you know, agree that we already agreed on these things we agreed on. Um, and then there were the... Then there were the proposals uh, that, that because they intended to regulate and control the behavior of others, had little chance of passing. Um, or if they did, then they were simply a restatement of norms already in place. If it was controversial, it wasn't going to pass a uh, consensus vote. If it wasn't controversial, it was simply a norm that already existed. You know, like we're opposed to racism and sexism. I mean, yeah, a lot of people say that and really aren't. Um, but then again, you know, what's the... What's, what's going to really be the effect of the, the proposal? Um, so I think that um, in those cases, these were all matters that needed to be discussed and debated. Um, but I, I don't think the way of dealing with it was trying to put it into the form of uh, a decision. Uh, and then there were the proposals about actions that didn't really need to be cited upon at all since whether or not some group of people engaged in the action had little bearing on those who did not want to participate. The only thing in question was whether a certain group of people believed they had the right to determine the actions of others for the simple reason that, and I, I'm sorry this is kind of convoluted, that for them the assembly meant a space where every individual or group could regulate the action of another uh, individual or group. And that to me is a kind of repulsive form of sovereignty. In truth, the only time when a decision like this need to be, uh, needs to be taken is when the existence of one action is fundamentally incompatible with another action that some group uh, wanted to undertake. And I think that, that those moments do exist, but oftentimes they don't. You know, so most of the time what really needed to happen was I would go and say, hey, we're going to do this. Um, what do you think about it? Uh, are you interested in doing it? And that's all that needed to be said. But oftentimes it was, we're going to do this, tell us yes or no. Um, and I don't think that's a particularly good way um, to, to kind of create uh, unity in a movement. Um, so I think that um, just in, in concluding, um, we could really reconceptualize what assemblies do. And maybe this doesn't work for every kind of assembly. Um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to kind of run a business or something like that, a, an occupied factory, <laughs> you have to make a lot of decisions, right? But, but for general assemblies in a kind of social movement, um, I'm thinking that, you know, it'd be helpful if assemblies were not a mechanism whereby any individual or group can control the actions of any other individual or group or through which they can decide upon, um, you know, what those people are going to do. They would instead primarily exist as places for debate, discussion, idea sharing, and collaboration, uh, and transparency. Most discussions would take the form of, this is what we want to do, what do you think about it, do you want to help, do you have any ideas? Um, many assemblies, I think, in, in, you know, really could possibly avoid decisions completely. There may be actually no need to really make decisions. Um, but I think that there are really crucial moments when decisions need to be made, when there's, you know, when there isn't really, um, you have two paths in front of you and everybody has to go on one of these paths together. And that's when you really do need to have a debate and have a decision. Um, but I'm thinking that, that it would be better if we thought of these as kind of exceptional moments. Um, as temporary, um, you know, uh, that, that a temporary exercise of the collective will in order to overcome a particular impasse uh, between parties. And that's to say that decision is then really just a technique to deal with um, contradiction and impasse among parties. It's not this kind of expression of the sovereign will or, you know, over every single person uh, in the social movement. It's just, a, it's, just a, it's just a technique to overcome a kind of moment of disagreement. Uh, the default state would be complete and total autonomy of all participants. Assemblies would function then through a kind of process of warding off the decision. And I'm thinking here of Klosters' notion of warding off the state, um, delaying and deferring the exercise of decision unless it's absolutely necessary. And so this is a kind of different way of, of maybe 
um, thinking about what assemblies uh, do that, that, that might be useful. Continue. Yeah. Okay. Maybe just uh, because I was appointed as a uh, discussant, <laughs> so I will just uh, maybe introduce the, the second person sure. is going to talk. Okay. So the first one, uh, uh, <laughs> the first one uh, already did his uh, presentation. Jasper Burns from Oakland, United States. Now, uh, Eileen Kuriel from Turkey is going to uh, speak. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm Eileen. I'm sorry my voice is a little gone, but I'll try to survive. Um, well, I'll be talking about the um, assemblies, general assemblies and the forums that uh, started to take place in Istanbul this summer after the Gezi occupation. There will be lots of overlaps between um, Jesper's account actually. But I want to start with um, a really simplified and shortened story of how the occupation of the Gezi Park in Istanbul started last May. And then um, I talk about the uh, forums and the different forms of self-organization that um, started after the eviction of the park. Well, um, I'm sure most of the people are familiar, but I still uh, think that it's kind of important to highlight some of the motivations and reasons behind the um, occupation of the Gezi Park. Well, it's it start. The initial aim of the occupation was the um, was to protect the park from being demolished and turned into a shopping mall and an Ottoman-style military barracks, and um, this was being protested, in fact, by um, especially the Chamber of Architects and different environmentalist groups since a while, but. Um, well, the occupation uh, started in the 27th of May, and it was it was it spread to uh, more than like 60 cities and provinces in the course of days. And this um, maneuver should be thought actually of as a part of a more general urban transformation process, which is full force at work in Istanbul and in other big cities in Turkey, which causes the public space to shrink every day a bit more and without the consent of the people living in the city. So with this uh, triggering factor, uh, millions of people were in the streets and this was met by systematic police violence for weeks. And the park itself was occupied for 16 days, but the protests continued after, long after it was evicted. And it's frequently mentioned, but again, uh, the profile of people, uh, people who were involved in the occupation and also the um, protests afterwards were really diverse, ranging from anarchists, socialists, communists, feminists, LGBT people, um, like anti-capitalist Muslims, or secularist, nationalist, um, Kemalists, and also a representative of, uh, representatives of the Kurdish movement. So it was quite a diverse group. And there has been many discussions about uh, the profile of the people and the reasons of the protests, and they both, I mean, these topic, topics deserve really long analysis maybe, but I just want to say a few words about the reasons uh, behind the accumulation of this restlessness for um, this diverse group, group of people. And firstly, of course, um, the, what we can call the neoliberal transformation of Istanbul and the, consequently the demolishing of the uh, cultural centers and shrinking of the public space and the privatization um, of the public space and uh, I mean the usual gentrification story and the eviction of the urban poor from the city center. And another crucial factor in the context of Turkey was the uh, ban on public demonstrations as we have witnessed in the previous 1st of May, or the struggle against the demolishing of one of the uh, theaters, Emek Theater. And it was like brutal uh, use of tear gas and even like uh, opening the bridges so that people cannot pass to go to the Taksim Square to celebrate the 1st of May. And uh, one more crucial factor 
was uh, more, well, um, what I can call maybe a conservative and authoritarian interventions of the uh, ruling party, AKP, uh, in people's everyday life. So uh, one example would be the ban on um, like restrictions on the consumption of alcohol, for instance. But it's not surprising that women's bodies uh, was one of the favorite um, like focus of uh, these kind of in interventions, which uh, became apparent in the government's attempt to ban abortion, which didn't happen, but their moralist remarks about women having at least three children, etc. And since a few days in Turkey, uh, the government started a new discussion about the inappropriateness of girls and boys uh, living together in student housing, for instance, or dormitories. So it's the, yeah, this constant like conservative interventions in everyday life together with the neoliberal um, authoritarian like, transformation uh, mainly on public space. And these uh, these reasons um, well against like neoliberal authoritarianism or crisis of representation are in some ways specific to Turkey but in some ways not at all so I mean as we all agree probably uh, the there are so many overlaps between these kind of struggles and I think is a resistance as well uh, should be situated in this like map of uh, political mobilizations in general but one thing for sure was that the, for the Turkish context, the scale of the events and the variety of the people who joined them was certainly unexpected and unprecedented and fascinating. Not only uh, during the occupation of the park, but also um, like the um, form of like assemblies that started after that, which I will speak about now. Well, actually, a few days before the park was evicted, already the parallel forums uh, started in the park, and that was mainly about the future of the park, like whether to um, like leave all the tents or leave one symbolic tent, because uh, police attack uh, eviction was expected any moment. So um, these were mainly the issues that were discussed in the, par in the forums in the park. But then there was no time to take a decision because the park was evicted two days after, on the 15th of June. But still, um, these were kind of the first attempts, the first um, experiments on creating these alternative forms of uh, communication and expression. So people were talking about their political views and cultural identities um, and about their future visions, etc. And the, the eviction of the park created this huge anger and uh, frustration and people were like, okay, if you take this Gizzi Park, then we have all the other parks in the city and we're going to continue um, occupying the public space, reclaiming the public space and uh, use it the way that we want to use it. So the forum started in the central neighborhoods of Istanbul, especially in um, Kadıköy and Taksim. But then it spread uh, to other other parts of the city and other cities. So it's reached about, I, I guess, 70 um, in total in overall Turkey. And the format was really quite similar to the Occupy um, forums. So um, like the same like silent gestures and uh, taking numbers to speak and applause is not allowed. I just said it's not allowed. <laughs> And um, it was really fascinating to see how people, how we quickly adapted to this new form of communication. It was new for uh, the context of Turkey. And um, like it was totally self-organized and horizontal and without leader. I mean, maybe this is a bit of a like romanticized or simplified account of it because of course in some neighborhoods um, some political parties were um, like more dominant in the forums and they were the ones raising their voices I mean there were conflicts as well but in general um, well it was in general um, quite like working quite smoothly and in the beginning um, the focus was mainly um, sharing of experience and um, 
maybe in a way like healing um, healing each other from this inevitably traumatic experience of um, the eviction and uh, constant police violence for weeks. But more than that, it was based on the excitement to protect the solidarity um, that emerged in the Gezi occupation and to carry that solidarity further and to make it more sustainable, basically. And one of the really important consequences of this is the um, like different groups from the same neighborhood becoming aware of each other and becoming aware of the possibility that they can work and do something together, as well as um, like different neighborhoods in the city becoming aware of each other. And like this um, like collaboration between people from the same neighborhood and between different neighborhoods resulted in um, like um, collaborative action, uh, decisions of actions that were taken in the forums. And of course the social media and for instance a weekly fanzine that was published to connect the forums and to um, make each other aware of uh, the decisions taken in different forums really helped um, this like web of forums. <laughs> And sometimes there were quite spontaneous uh, action decisions, um, such as like going to the Egyptian embassy in front of the embassy and um, protesting the army taking over, or going to um, in front of one of the TV channels to protect uh, to protest the censorship. Um, but there were also quite. Uh, like more systematically taken decisions such as joining the uh, protests in solidarity with the Kurdish town of Lije uh, where protesters were attacked by the police and one person was killed and there was a huge uh, participation from the forums to this demonstration which was quite impressive for the Turkish context like seeing um, more like secularist nationalists uh, Kemalists working uh, walking like side by side with um, Kurdish people shouting Kurdish slogans I mean all these things were kind of um, like symptoms signs of um, different encounters and a kind of like transformation taking place in these encounters. The same for the um, gay pride, for LGBT pride, uh, which again, um, I got a lot of participation from the forums uh, and reached up to 50,000 people, which was a record uh, for the gay pride in Turkey. <coughs> So in general, um, it was definitely uh, a moment that was bending towards solidarity and is still bending towards solidarity in an unpre unprecedented way. And other more um, like general plans discussed in the forums were boycotting big brands, um, collaborating with small shop owners, um, like both as a way to like oppose the, the domination of neoliberal capitalist markets, but also as a way to oppose the government's constant provocation of the shop owners against the protesters. And as well as like boycotting mainstream media and forming social media platforms, there were also crash courses on things like first aid or the legal rights or um, the secure use of internet and so on. Mobile theaters were set, summer camps were organized, exchange days were organized in the parks, and there were open kitchens and city markets. And also uh, forums became the places for um, calls for general actions, um, such as the commemoration of the Sivas massacre or like the um, usual gatherings in the Taksim Square every Saturday, or visits to um, the hospitals for the injured people, uh, injured in the um, protests. And um, just one thing, um, well, the anger um, and the reaction against the government and against um, like the Prime Minister Erdogan was, of course, one of the most like popular um, common subject of the forums. But there were also moments that went beyond it, beyond the like one evil figure of the Prime Minister and um, like. I mean, of course, these were quite important, but on the other hand, the moments that went beyond it, such as like, questioning the logic of the nation state in general, or the history of Turkish Republic, or the like, complicity of the governments that came before the current government, um, 
were really important for me. I, that is uh, one of the most significant, remarkable consequences of this um, form of assembly that allowed people to um, question the history of the um, like oppressive discriminatory nation state that we're living in. So like the moment in which people said um, that they were questioning themselves in relation to the Kurdish issue because they trusted the mainstream media so far, but actually now they don't trust it anymore because they were the ones being censored now. And um, like saying things like if there will be a peace process between um, the Kurdish and Turkish parts, it will not come from the government, but it will come from the collaboration and brotherhood and sisterhood between uh, the Turkish and Kurdish resistors. Um, so these were um, like questioning of the broader systems um, were really um, like significant, and uh, the the form of like the form of forum uh, allowed these things to take place. And what I realized was. Um, like open stage is, I mean, there are disadvantages and advantages of open stage. Of course, it's great that uh, there is no agenda or topic being imposed and people can come up with their own subjects. But then um, thematic forums worked quite well as well. So in that sense, the one on, uh, let's say, the Kurdish issue or the one on LGBT movement, like those like specific and thematic uh, forums worked quite well to uh, maybe avoid the tendency of the forums to be too long and not too focused and to be too scattered and being exhausted. Exhausting. Um, just briefly, um, other common topics were um, like the 10% election threshold or how to include people who have not been part of the resistance so far and how to reach the AKP supporters and how to make the language, the public discourse in the forums, like less sexist, less, less uh, militarist, and less oppressive. So, um, like changing our language first, and um, well, form, forming working groups, um, which was maybe a way to like overcome what you were saying about forums being. Um, temporary uh, spaces and in a way like unsustainable spaces for a long time. So lots of working groups emerged out of uh, the forums in Istanbul like focusing on different issues like local urban transformations, gentrification processes or um, like working on social media and communication, precarity, women rights, LGBT rights and union rights and so on. So I guess um, in, this, in this sense the forums um, like took the struggle to a local level but also uh, provided a bridge between local and broader struggles. Like people could take decisions about what's going on in their streets like building of a new parking lot or opening of a new supermarket and so on. But they, can also, they could also get organized for uh, more general issues such as the building of the third bridge uh, in Istanbul, which is another catastrophe for, uh, for the city and for the nature. So yeah, um, they have been an experimentation of direct democracy in that sense. As, as opposed to the pseudo-representative uh, democracy based on elections. So I, I want to finish with two examples, um, like similar to the working groups. I think um, it's important to mention like other forms of self-organization which um, emerged out of the forums. Like, Okay, at the end of the summer it was getting cold and uh, people were getting a bit exhausted and the number of the people joining the forums uh, have, uh, was decreased. But um, like during these discussions from one of the forums, for instance, the decision was taken to squat a building and, um, in Kadıköy. And now there's a, a, not the first squat, it would not be fair to say that it's the first squat because um, like in Turkey, um, like immigrants from other cities or homeless people or, um, well, I mean, there are, there are lots of um, 
occupying building experiments or building uh, shanty towns from scratch, etc. But this is the first first squad in the sense that we know them in here, for instance, like an autonomous culture center. So um, that experiment is still going on. And um, another one was um, a Kosovo resistance. Uh, maybe if you've heard of it, that the textile factory. Um, a textile factory was shut down like nine, ten months ago, and um, a couple of workers, ten to fifteen workers, um, started to resist um, building a tent, like building tents in front of the factory. But after the Gezi occupation and after the forums, they decided to um, occupy the factory. And now, since a few weeks, they are they also started to produce and they're selling um, the products that they produce. So, I mean, of course we can't say that Gezi or forums caused this because it was already happening, but one of the um, really important consequences of the forums is that it strengthened the already existing existent uh, struggles, especially workers' struggles and student, uh, student struggles. So creating visibility for the existing struggles and strengthening them and maybe um, a general contagious a sense of power empowerment, basically. And of course, like um, like connecting these struggles and uh, forums have become like the space to like discuss all these and connect different struggles to each other, which is extremely important to overcome their isolation, marginalization, or exhaustion. Oh, I can leave it here, I guess, yeah. Thank you. So we pass the word to Dimitris from the Viome Workaround Factory at Thessaloniki, Greece. Kalispera se olos. Good evening. Here I'm going to be here with my agonists. It's good to be here with us all together. Μας δίνει δύναμη. Uh, well, uh, basically I'll be translating because Dimitris doesn't speak any English. So uh, he's very happy to be here uh, with all, uh, how would you call it, uh, fellow strugglers. Uh, it's very important uh, to, for us to meet to exchange experiences. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ για την πρόσκληση αυτή στο μάζεμα πολλών συνεργατικών εγχειρημάτων που εκτός των άλλων μας δίνει τη δυνατότητα να ανταλλάξουμε εμπειρία. Uh, we thank you very much for this invitation to participate in this gathering of uh, uh, cooperative attempts uh, that uh, beside everything else give us the opportunity to exchange uh, our experiences. Τι ήταν το εργοστάσιο της Βιομέ; Οι αιτίες που έφτασε σε αυτό το σημείο. Uh, what was the factory of Viome? Uh, what were the causes that uh, led it to this uh, position it is in today? Ένα εργοστάσιο πολύ δυναμικό, εμπορικά και με μεγάλη οικονομική ανάπτυξη σύμφωνα με τις αποδείξεις που έχουμε. According to the numbers we have, uh, it was a factory which was uh, growing. It was a financially a very active factory with. Uh, an exporting factory, I may add, uh, which a huge growth in the last years. Αλλά μέσα σε μικρό χρονικό διάστημα, συστηματικά, κατάφεραν να το κομιζήσουν και να τραβήξουν από μέσα ό,τι δυνατότητα οικονομική είχε και φυσικά σε συνδυασμό με την κρίση κατάφεραν να το κλείσουν. But in a very short time and systematically, they managed mm. to suck uh, the factory dry and. Uh, 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 to pull all uh, economic potential out of the factory and in combination with the uh, global crisis they managed to close the factory. Well, the, he will talk about the union of Viome and about the activities he's done in the past. Το σωματείο κατάφερε να κάνει τα μία λοβοήθειας και επίσης πήραμε και ανακυκλώναμε όλες τις ύλες προς ανακύκλωση. Κάναμε τράπεζα αίματος που λόγω πολλών αγώνων δεν προχώρησε. Η Ουνιον, αυτό είναι πριν το φάκτορι κλώσσε, είχε δημιουργήσει ένα φάκτορι για τους εργαζόμενους του φάκτορι της Ουνιον. 
it's a, I may note it's a union of this particular factory and uh, also the union recycled all uh, materials that were left over from the production and they also attempted to make a blood bank uh, solidarity blood bank which uh, for various reasons didn't uh, 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 come off και με τον καιρό ανακαλύψαμε πως δεν μας αρμόζει η ανάθεση και οθετήσαμε ως τρόπο λειτουργίας μόνο τη Γενική Συνέλευση. And in time and through these actions uh, we uh, found out that uh, representation it's not something that uh, is working for us and we decided to, to make, take all our decisions through the General Assembly of the Union. Ο αγώνας μας που κράτησε για αρκετό διάστημα, περίπου δύο χρόνια, μέχρι την είσοδο στο εργοστάσιο και την επιλειτουργία του και λέμε πως αυτό ευθύνεται η πολιτική εξουσία και η αγροφοκατία του συνδικαλισμού που σπαθώντας να κερδίσει χρόνο καθυστερούσε εμάς. Uh, our struggle lasted for a long time. Uh, it was about two years before we entered the factory and occupied it uh, and, uh, and started to, to function it again. And we believe that the cause of that is uh, the political power, uh, that means the government, uh, and the syndicalist bureaucracy who tried to delay us uh, for their own gains. Well, entering the factory and the activities from then on. Organized parties, cut up all the Διανομή των προϊόντων με άλλη φιλοσοφία και τα χρησιμοποίηση το δίκτυο της αλληλεγγύης. Uh, we organized uh, the production under a different basis uh, and we uh, started to distribute the produce uh, not with, uh, with another philosophy, not with profit in mind, uh, but uh, and using the network of the solidarity. Και φυσικά η ιδεολογία μας που μέσα από τη συνελεύση έχει αντιποτυπωθεί και αποφασιστεί η οριζόντια οργάνωση τόσο σε μισθού, όσο και σε δικαιώματα με το ένα εργαζόμενο μία ψήφο, με κανεί μη εργαζόμενο μέτοχο, κανεί μέτοχο μη εργαζόμενο. And of course, with uh, our ideology that, through, that has been set down through our assemblies, uh, which states that uh, all workers will have equal uh, salaries, there will be no differential in the salaries. And uh, uh, that all workers have equal rights, that uh, all workers are equal participants in the factory, they have one vote and there is no, no, let's say, no one who has a share of the factory who isn't a worker of the factory and uh, no worker who doesn't have a share in the factory. <laughs> Τότητα όλων των αξιωμάτων με πλήρη εργατικό έλεγχο στην παραγωγή και αυτοδιεύθυνση μέσα από τη γενική συνέλευση των εργαζομένων. Uh, this functions through a complete, uh, uh, let's say, a recycling of the offices of the union. Uh, typically, uh, this is my own addition. Typically, the union legally has to have a president, but uh, in practic uh, practically just every worker changes places in uh, their uh, role in the union and in the factory. And Mas this is a de every <coughs> decision is going through the General Assembly. Uh, they ask us sometimes what uh, the difference is of Viome with, uh, in comparison to other cooperatives. Και απαντάμε, η Βιομέ δεν έχει διαφορά στο ξεκίνημα, αλλά η διαφορά είναι σε αυτά που λέει, σε αυτά που έχει ψηφίσει και βασικά σε αυτά που κάνει. And we answer that uh, Βιομέ didn't start differently. Uh, the difference is in what it has decided, what it has voted and uh, basically in what it does. Για να μπορέσει να λειτουργήσει τα σχέδιά μας για το μέλλον. Uh, the, to be able to function the factory and our plans for the future. Τι ενέργειες κάνουμε για την ομοποίηση του χειρίματος; Θα το έλεγα νοημοφάνεια, ώστε να μπορέσουμε να εξάγουμε το παραγόμενο προϊόν με στόχο τον τετραπλασιασμό του κύκλου εργασιών της προηγούμενης επιχείρησης. Uh, we have taken several actions uh, for legalizing uh, this uh, attempt. Uh, we could call it more a legal front, in a way. Uh, so that uh, the produce that is now made is will be able to be uh, exported outside of the country 
and with the goal of uh, quadrupling the cycle of work of uh, the previous of the, the old factory. Και φυσικά τη δικτύωση με άλλα εχειρήματα και τη γενίκευση σε όλη την κοινωνία. And of course uh, expanding our network to other uh, similar uh, attempts and uh, generalizing it in the whole society. Αγωνιζόμαστε για όλη την εργατική τάξη, για τις οικογένειές μας, για την αξιοπρέπειά μας, για το μέλλον μας. Uh, we fight for the whole working class, for our families, for our dignity and for our future. Εργάτες όλου του κόσμου ενωθείτε. Αυτός ο αγώνας είναι αγώνας όλων μας. Workers of all the world unite. This struggle is the struggle of us all. Όπως λέει και το ρητό, όποιος αγωνίζεται μπορεί να χάσει να κερδίσει. Όποιος δεν αγωνίζεται έχει ήδη χάσει. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. As is being said often, uh, he who struggles uh, may win or may lose. He who doesn't struggle has already lost. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I was basically only going to translate, but uh, I will uh, add a few words on behalf of the Solidarity Movement to Viomé. Uh, because basically this speech is designed mostly for Greek audiences that have uh, well, basic, the basic knowledge about the whole story of the factory. Uh, so I don't know, some people may know, uh, it happened that in last December I gave a speech here in, uh, in the Bollocks about uh, Viomé. And we also had a speech in Utrecht uh, through Skype with uh, one of the workers. But anyhow, uh, the Viome was a subsidiary of a multinational factory, a tile factory, Filkeram Johnson. Uh, the subsidiary was producing basically building materials, uh, glues, grouts, everything you would need to put on a tile on the wall or on the floor or on the ceiling. Um, to get a picture, it was, you can't really say that it was a big factory, it was about, on its largest scale, uh, it was maybe about 90 people working, which means both ground workers, uh, accountants, chemists, whatever. Uh, but to get a picture about the, what the economical uh, size of the factory was, uh, the whole airport of Dubai has been built with materials from Viome and from its mother factory. Once a week, a whole aeroplane would fill with products and leave Thessaloniki for Dubai to build. Um, well, over the years and starting the crisis, of course, difficulties started to arise in the building market. It's a big problem uh, in uh, Greece especially. Uh, you could say uh, in Greece most uh, building workers were from Albania. Well, all the Albanians have either migrate, migrated back to their own country, or they're now living in Dubai and working in the building uh, construction there. So, with the reduction of the building uh, market, of course, problems started to arise for both the mother factory as its subsidiaries. And the end result was that in 2011, uh, the mother factory went bankrupt, and the subsidiary Viome was not bankrupt because it was profitable, but just abandoned. So, well, and this is what I would mainly would like to add and would like to stress because of the topic of this discussion is it's not the first factory that has been abandoned in Greece. It's the factories in Greece have closed over the past years are uncountable. Every day we hear about factories closing, uh, people losing their jobs uh, or people just uh, being, the, their salaries being reduced. Typically there is a uh, vehicle industry in Thessaloniki, uh, where also Viome is uh, basically a military vehicle, tanks and trucks, etc., which is now in a state of, I forget the word in English, it's when uh, legally the owner, with the owner is the state, uh, is being blocked from firing people because they owe them money. So they don't work, but they can't be fired because they don't work. Um, it's simple to say that their salaries used to be, let's say, 
uh, if a, a, a medium salary was about 1,500,000 uh, no, euro, no, sorry, 1,500 euro, 1,500, it's now at about 700. It's been reduced to about 50%. Uh, well, with all this destruction we're experiencing in Greece, with reduction of salaries and people losing their jobs and factories closing, uh, the logical question is, why is Viome the only factory, factory for the time being who has been occupied and is again functioning? And for me, the big difference is the assembly of the union. It's very important to note that we've been in contact with many other factories and in many other factories who have similar problems, who are in danger of closing, there are people, there are workers who are interested in doing something similar or trying something similar. Okay, you can't say that it's easy in a tank factory to occupy it and build tanks by yourself. <laughs> but there are people who are interested in this problem and want to see how, what they can do, do something else. But uh, usually uh, you have a syndicalist bureaucracy in the, the factory who basically sabotages every struggle. This particular factory, Elvo, is a big example of the sabotage of the syndicalist bureaucracies. The difference in Viome was very simple. No syndicate bureaucracy, just workers who decided everything with their own assembly. And because they came to a point where the decision was or we take over the factory or we just go unemployed and basically that means starving our families to death. And there were no political gains and no nothing basically than just simple survival. The decision taken by the workers themselves was to occupy the factory. But it's, I am completely convinced that this idea would probably, even if it had come up, wouldn't have moved forward if it wasn't for the assembly of the factory. Uh, of course, uh, and not tr trying not to sound uh, speaking about ourselves, about the solidarity, but it's something that the workers always are saying, is that they couldn't have done it themselves. In the beginning, the plan they made about functioning the factory of themselves, they circulated it in, let's say, official circles, in, uh, to the Communist Party, to uh, the Workers' Centre of Thessaloniki, to several uh, members of Parliament. No interest, no answer. So they decided to put at this point to, more generally, the society, the general workers and social movement. And there they found people who were interested in this thing, who wanted to support this thing, who would like to do such a thing. And from just a simple factory who tried, to, the people of it tried to survive and tried to take it over, it became a movement not adju just about Viomé, not just about the workers of Viomé trying to survive. It became that, but more than that, a struggle for taking over all the factories and all the means of production from those who in the end are stealing our work and stealing our own lives. It was a struggle about taking this, the decisions of this struggle and now I am talking about decisions, uh, decisions of the this, of this struggle in our own hands and not leaving uh, someone who was appointed or was voted by who knows who and who with what means to decide for us and basically a struggle to create a better society, to overthrow one of the main points of uh, the struggle is organizing a general political continuous strike, which basically means overthrowing the government and trying to, well, destroy the system, just change the system, call it what you like, but creating a better society. That's about it. <laughs> Thank you, Navi Ward, uh, to Peter from Barcelona. <laughs> Hello. Uh, just before I start, uh, sometimes I have a tendency to talk too fast, so please, anyone at any moment, if I'm speaking too quickly to understand, just yell at me, um, and I'll try to slow down. <laughs> yeah, he can kick me, it'll be good. Um, 
I want to, to start by mentioning that um, this uh, this past Wednesday uh, in Barcelona, uh, five comrades were arrested under the anti-terror law, and then there were also a number of comrades who are still facing uh, facing trial from the general strike of uh, 29th of March 2012. Um, so I would just like to, to start by remarking on that, um, because struggle always always comes with consequences, and, and we can't uh, forget about the prisoners of our struggles. Um, also, um, yeah, this is a, a reduced format, but for those who are interested in, in learning more about the current situation in Barcelona, uh, another comrade and I will be giving uh, a talk at 4 o'clock in the uh, FOCO, what's it called? Uh, anyone? Yeah. Um, on Monday. On Monday, yeah, yeah. Um, for anyone who is uh, who's still around. Um, so... Basically, on the 15th of May 2011, uh, a group in Madrid calling itself uh, Real Democracy Now! Uh, put out a call for countrywide protests uh, across the Spanish state uh, demanding uh, what they referred to as a real democracy now or then in, in 2011. Um, in many cities, that uh, turned immediately into an occupation of a central plaza somewhere in the city after the protest march. In Barcelona, that didn't happen until the 16th of May. May. Uh, nonetheless, I'm going to refer to it as uh, the, the 15th of May movement. Um, I should put out there that I'm really glad that the 15th of May movement happened for all of the opportunities of, of struggle that it constituted, but nearly everything that I'm going to say uh, about it right now is, is uh, a criticism, uh, in, in some ways very harsh. I don't want to paint this picture of us against them, of the 99% fighting bravely against the 1% of the working class, uh, against whomever. Um, even though those kind of antagonisms were very important, and I think that was actually a part of what some of us, and when I say us, I'm speaking about certain anarchists who um, I guess we had some affinity in, in, in how we participated in all that. Um, creating that kind of antagonism, that kind of consciousness of us versus, versus them, was something that was... Uh, I wouldn't say lacking, but I would say maybe manipulated or, or presented in a very watered-down version in, uh, by the organizers or the would-be organizers of the 15th of May movement. Uh, so we, as anarchists, were trying to create um, another idea of that antagonism. But I'm not going to talk about that now, um, because all of us or most of us here would be a part of a part of that us. Uh, so it's I think it's less interesting to talk about the the heroic struggle of, of the oppressed proletariat against our our evil dominators and talk about the very very real conflicts that were happening within uh, the the 15th of May of May movement. Um, these, these were conflicts that were constantly uh, threatening or promising to steer that struggle in one direction or, or in another, uh, and, and uh, yeah, conflicts in which a lot of us uh, put a lot on the line. Um, and there were often conflicts among comrades, so even though I'm going to make very harsh criticisms, uh, these are criticisms that are directed against people who at even certain moments included friends, other people who maybe um, one might find kind of disgusting, but they're still just no normal people like, uh, like, like you, and, and they're not uh, you know, figures of the ruling parties or, or bankers or, or any of that. Some contextual information. Um, so 16th of May, the uh, occupation came to Barcelona, the occupation of Plaza Catalunya. Um, <clears throat> it uh, quickly, uh, the first night there was about 100 people in the meeting, then the next night 1,000, then after that 10,000. Uh, by the first weekend, so within under a week, it uh, uh, grew to beyond 100,000 people to the point where, where numbers, body counts became meaningless because the number of people trying to participate in some way in the occupation could not physically fit within Plaza Catalunya. And for those who haven't been to Barcelona, we're talking about a very, very large uh, uh, plaza. Um, the capacity for self-organization within that occupation on strictly technical levels was, was very advanced. They quickly got themselves a sound system befitting a major concert uh, for someone like uh, Bono to come and play uh, that, uh, of course, was instead used uh, for, for the Central Assembly. Um, and still there were so many people there that not everyone could hear uh, uh, what, was, what was being said at the center of the plaza. Um, 
So it, it lasted in these large numbers for several weeks. After about three weeks, uh, the, the occupation sort of diffused to the neighborhood assemblies, which uh, already existed in, uh, let's say, six neighborhoods in Barcelona. But uh, the 15th of May movement transformed these. They started meeting uh, weekly, to also taking over uh, plazas in their respective neighborhoods and going for, in the example of my neighborhood, going from 10 people meeting once every two weeks in the neighborhood association office to up to 1.300 people meeting in the central plaza of our neighborhood uh, every week without a permit, um, Yeah, fighting for our, our ability to be there. Um, leaving, I should add, a number of very committed activists uh, in Plaza Catalunya trying to hold on to their precious structures and commissions and all the rest and keep these from crumbling uh, while, while everyone else had, had uh, gone to their, their respective affinity groups or neighborhood assemblies or, uh, or what have you. Um, once the, the physical occupation was, oh, and I can also throw in there that at one point the police evicted it, uh, it was resisted, um, uh, reoccupied. Um, once the physical space of the Plaza Catalunya occupation was no longer in existence, uh, the 15th of May movement continued to exist in, in the manifestation of um, mass mobilizations that would happen every so often. For example, the, the one year anniversary or several months later uh, around elections to surround parliament one time uh, and, and so forth. Um, so it, it's a movement that people still talk about as something that's current even though it is no longer there in Plaza Catalunya. Plaza Catalunya has been returned to the tourists and the pigeons. Um, let's see. Conflicts. Um, when when we were in uh, Plaza Catalunya, there were a lot of debates among comrades about how to participate there. Some comrades thought that uh, this was very important what was happening, so many strangers uh, coming together that all they should do is throw their, their experience behind this phenomenon to help moderate the assemblies, to, uh, to, to help organize these different structures and commissions and etc. Um, I agree that what was happening was extremely important in terms of uh, 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 an, an at least temporary blow against capitalist alienation, hundreds of thousands of strangers coming together, debating, getting to know one another, making friends, making enemies. Uh, what have you, um, but uh, that this this approach of getting on critically behind it was was extremely flawed, uh, and that was that was one major. Um, point of discussion. Most of those who supported it did so in the name of, of uh, direct democracy. And for a lot of us, democracy actually became the, the watchword that sort of determined what, uh, what side of a very important line you were on in terms of how to uh, relate to this struggle. Um, I would argue that uh, the Plaza Catalunya occupation uh, showed really beyond any doubt uh, that there is no fundamental difference between direct democracy and rep uh, representative democracy, uh, that in questions of form, uh, in, uh, yeah, in terms of form, it's a question of scale, that once you got mm, past 100,000 people uh, trying to participate in uh, an assembly, uh, no one could reasonably claim that, that, that this was, was some legitimate decision-making uh, organism that represented all of us, because so many people couldn't even hear what was being said, uh, much less make it to the front of this very long speaker's line to get their permitted five minutes or whatever to, to state some alienated opinion that people would nod about or ask their neighbors, you know, what, what, was, uh, what was that about, uh, before the next person got up and, and launched off on, on their next little uh, pet peeve. Um, and let's see, um, there's, there's plenty of, of, of anecdotes about the ex extreme bureaucratization of that occupation that I could go into, um, but it's, uh, various articles have been written, out, uh, written about it. It's, that, that information out, is out there. It was an extremely bureaucratic process, I'll just uh, resume, uh, with, with different commissions. Um, basically, uh, based on this idea of, of unity of action, this idea of, of unit, also unity of, of, of decision making. Um, so the different uh, structures that were created were, were commissions, sort of thematic commissions. So instead of affinity groups, instead of uh, groups with their own projectuality, their own idea of what to do, how to confront this reality and bring people together to, to work about it, it was dividing one sort of unified uh, act, uh, action or, or um, terrain of action into its component parts in a very bureaucratic or, or democratic way. So you would have uh, the fundraising commission, the translation commission, the kitchen commission, uh, et cetera, so on and so forth. Um, 
So one group of anarchists decided to participate in these commissions critically. Uh, some of us uh, disagreed with that approach and we're, we're um, you know, on, the, on the other side of that debate. But it was interesting to see what happened from those anarchists who participated in the commissions critically. They participated in the uh, direct democracy self-organization uh, commission, which was interesting because at a certain point people raised criticisms like, you know, we're against direct democracy. Direct democracy is a form of, of recuperation. Uh, we believe in self-organization. And whatever moderator at the moment was like, yeah, 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 okay, we'll create a commission of direct democracy and self-organization. It's like, no, coño, they're, they're completely opposite things. But this was actually really good because it, it put together some of the believers in direct democracy together with, with these rabid anarchists who were ferociously trying to destroy democracy, led to some really good debates. And I mean, if I can simplify things such, the anarchists won that debate. And after a week of, of these people mm, raising their blood pressure, who knows how much, wasting uh, hours and hours and hours of their lives, uh, this was another important thing. You, uh, your, your voice in direct democracy doesn't matter as much unless you can dedicate eight hours a day to meetings, uh, sitting, sitting on the concrete uh, floor. Um, anyways. Um, after uh, like a solid week of debates, they finally won within the commission. The, the sub actually no, sorry, this was a subcommittee of the contents committee. The contents committee is the committee that determines the contents of our, of our movement. So all of us are we're the vessel of the movement, and there's a special committee. Too too fast, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, there's a special committee to determine the content of, of our shining, happy vessel of direct democracy. So we're, we're there to take the streets and to create the spectacle. And then there's people who have the debates that tell us what we actually believe in or why we're there or something like that. It took, it took the plaza occupation, I think, about two weeks to come up with, with like a, a one-page pamphlet about what we believe in. It certainly wasn't, sure as hell wasn't what I believed in or what a lot of other people believed in. And, and uh, it was actually a pretty horrible set of things to believe in, like we want to recover democracy or this isn't a real democracy or other um, various uh, statements um, pregnant with historical amnesia. Um, whereas, whereas on the other hand, um, anarchists uh, functioning autonomously, having debates, working collectively or individually were every single day putting out one, two or three new uh, flyers, full page of, of, of text, printing them out in the thousands on the basis of a freaking donations cup that we had on our table and people would like what they read and, and give it to us and you would see people on the other side of the city reading these things, constant interventions in the debates of the assembly the night before using uh, autonomous self-organization, not waiting for permission from anybody and, and the freaking contents commission, committee, whatever took I think two weeks to come up with like one single pamphlet about what we all believe in and it was, it was a freaking insult in terms of like the, the sort of homogenized idea of why we were there that, that only spoke to to some people. I'm branching off in a lot of different uh, directions. Anyways, the, the people in that subcommittee of the Contents Commission uh, came up with a proposal to essentially dissolve the Central Assembly, to turn the Central Assembly into nothing more than a, a space of encounter, a place for people to come up and uh, rant, share what they were angry about, uh, uh, launch proposals that other people could then tack on to without waiting for permission from any higher group as to whether they were allowed to act. That's, I mean, that's the big sham of democracy. Democracy gives us freedom of speech, and the uh, the, the trade-off is we have to surrender our freedom of action. Uh, that's that's the sort of freedom that you that one encounters in in, uh, uh, in an isolation cell in prison. They they can speak all they want. They're not allowed to do anything to change their environment. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So, like I said. They went through all this process. They got this. They got consensus within the hundred people or whatever who were in the subcommittee of the committee of the the, the central assembly. I took it to the general assembly. Um, and there were all these bureaucratic maneuvers. I won't go into them at length. But basically, this was probably the, uh, one of four or five proposals in all that time that had the most support, the most popular support among the maybe 50,000 people who were there at, at that moment that people had thought about the most because people who were opposed to it required that the proposal be read out and then voted on the next day after people had more time to think about it, which was not done with any other proposal. Um, and then finally, the, the, whole, the whole thing was sabotaged by about 30 Trotskyists and, and, and other vanguardists who, who voted against it out of like 50,000 people, uh, demonstrating how many people wanted to dissolve the Central Assembly um, as, as a unified decision-making structure and, and how that, the very structures of uh, even like a, a 
um, structure of direct democracy that, that gave importance to consensus was capable of, of shooting that down to preserve its, its sort of centralized hierarchical and bureaucratic nature. Um, others of us, um, I guess, had a more chaotic understanding of what we were doing there, what we should be doing there. Um, some of us argue that we should not give legitimacy to these commissions. We should not give legitimacy to the center of, of the circle, the central space at, of, the, of, of, of the assembly of the occupation, which is the one space where, where control and co-optation is possible. Uh, and, and you can tell that for sure because every single political party member who went there secretly trying to take over this thing, every single NGO worker, every single person with, with some kind of paranoia about order and, and, and organization and everything needing to be uh, uh, lined up could be found at that central space waiting for their turn on the mic to, uh, uh, to which everyone had to listen. Um, so the, this other anarchist proposal, the, the sort of pro-chaos proposal, was to be on the margins and to constantly give life to the margins so that the center could never assert its legitimacy over the margins. Because at the margins of, of, of uh, Plaza Catalunya, and also uh, physically, geographically, we're talking about a relatively large space, so many things happen in those weeks that the people who were basically like wanting to shoot themselves in the head because they're sitting through eight hours of, of whatever debate with a... Um, a bunch of progressives in, in, in some, some commission uh, largely missed. There were people who were self organizing concerts, self organizing debates, self organizing talks by comrades who had come from other countries and wanted to share and didn't want to go to some commission, wait in line, sign off on a piece of paper for what pl uh, place they're allowed to have a talk and could just see look, I can see with my own eyes, this space is not being used right now. I'm going to put up a little sign, sit here, talk. 200 people will come. We'll do this together. It'll be great. Um, here, I want to go, I, I go into. Um, into mapping, touch on mapping briefly, briefly which, is, which is really important. Um, and, and I want to mention that maybe this, this relates to uh, like some of our, our comrades who are, who are in, in the academy, that there are maybe good things that they can win from this uh, perspectives, information, resources, but also generally uh, people uh, in the academy who have an interest in radical struggles are constantly encouraged uh, by their superiors to engage in projects of mapping. Uh, that's also mapping is uh, also what uh, anthropologists and sociologists were doing for the U.S. occupation in, in Iraq. Uh, mapping is basically trying to take a chaotic, heterogeneous genius social space and make it legible from above. Make it so that uh, someone sitting on top, whether it's an elected representative, whether it's uh, all of us together with access to the Central Assembly or the police or whomever, can look at a space and, and read what's happening and understand everything that's happening there. In these chaotic margins that we were organizing, it was impossible for anyone, one person, to get uh, uh, an idea of everything that was going on. It was simply impossible, which is a much better space for us on so many levels, from uh, uh, repression to uh, um, to, to, to basically learning through through all these these differences, um, the people who uh, controlled the mics, the the, the official moderators and, and whatnot of the Central Assembly, uh, were constantly saying, you know, bear with us. This is difficult. What we're trying to do here, we're uh, we're giving a voice to twenty thousand people, and that was a bold faced lie. They weren't giving a voice to twenty thousand people. They were stealing the voices of nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine people. We, we we don't need anyone to come give us a voice. And in all of the moments up to the Central Assembly and after the Central Assembly. There were 20,000 conversations going on in Plaza Catalunya, and, and that all had to be silenced uh, to, to listen to this boring, ineffective, horrible assembly, which might have been more interesting if it were simply, simply people coming there to share information, information that everyone should know. Uh, I'm here on the mic right now to talk to these 50,000 people because all of you should know this is happening in my neighborhood. People are, get, are being evicted. We should go there tomorrow and fight back. Or I came from this other country. This is what's happening. Things like that, um, in, instead of uh, uh, trying to force us all to go through the same decisions. There were simply uh, general Generally, as a, as a pretty valid generalization within that central space, there was no need for, for centralized decision making. There was no need for all of us to come to the same decision because conflict is good. Conflict is how we learn, which is exactly why states and status mentality constantly wants to keep us from having conflicts because that is how we become true human beings. That's how we learn to self-organize. Uh, I can't remember if it was Bakun and Malatesta, probably both of them said, uh, I'm paraphrasing horribly, uh, freedom is something that you learn how to use only in conditions of freedom. Uh, and that's that's absolutely true. Only only by having entering into conflict with fellow people, people who are doing things that might seem to you like total bullshit, uh, and being able to go up to them and say, this looks to me like total bullshit. Why are you doing this? And then they tell you why, and, and then you argue. 
and then you learn things. That's that's the only way to, to, to really go forward. And the Central Assembly was was preventing that conflict out of this this sort of statist paranoia that we need to organize things. We need to to keep these conflicts from breaking out. What if one group wants to have uh, a march and then another group wants to do the, the, this other thing? Worrying about problems that haven't even um, arisen. Um, how, how am I doing on time? <laughs> okay, whatever. All right. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, um, ah, yeah, 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 fuck. Uh, going back to the beginning. Um, it's really important to point out that the call for the Plaza Occupation Movement did not happen in uh, a social vacuum. It did not happen in a context of increasing popular rage that had simply not connected, that, that had not found collective expression. It didn't happen at a time when people needed uh, uh, to, to, to come together because they hadn't come together yet. And in fact, two weeks before the 15th of May 2011, uh, anti-capitalists of various stripes held their 1st of May rally and said, of going the usual route, they, they marched up to Sarria, which is a rich neighborhood, and they, they fucked shit up for like, a, I don't know, like time suspends in those kind of moments. It felt like four hours, it was maybe just 40 minutes, who knows, but for a very long time, smashing hundreds of banks and luxury stores and, and setting a couple luxury cars on fire and, and all of that, and this was amazing that, that the media kept completely silent about it. They did not show this. They're like, oh, there were some minor uh, scuffles with police, but everything's under control, because they knew how many millions of people would see these evil, horrible, masked anarchists going and destroying a, a rich neighborhood and say, that's what we need to be doing. More of this needs to happen. Um, there, already we started this cycle of, of general strikes in... Um, uh, throughout the, the Spanish state. Uh, the 29th of September 2010, there was the first general strike in several years in Barcelona that uh, devolved into uh, pretty heavy rioting. A police car was burned, which, which became this symbol, uh, this really uh, inspiring symbol that new things were possible. And then all of a sudden you have the 15th of May movement talking about what we need is a real democracy now. What we need is, is to reform the electoral uh, laws so that we don't have a two-party system, so that we can have a functioning democracy, a multi-party democracy like, you know, what they have in, like, Germany or the Netherlands, you know, that works, like, fucking great. Um, th th this is... This is complete historical amnesia because uh, uh, in, in Spain it had only been a few decades, only since the 70s, when you had a transition from dictatorship to democracy and anyone who, who cared to, to, to face the facts could see that democracy in this case and so many other cases was nothing more than a more effective system of social control. Democracy was brought in for two reasons. One, because a movement of wildcat strikes was making Spain completely untenable for investment and, and, and was showing that the, the fascist... Uh, Francoist strategies of social control could not work, could no longer guarantee the, the passivity and, and participation of the population. And two, because ETA, now a terrorist group, blew up uh, Franco's handpicked successor. So the sort of charismatic, uh, big leader-based uh, uh, system of control, which is fascism, couldn't work because, because Carrero Blanco was blown to... Um, you know, a thousand tiny bits um, by by a group which uh, by the democracy would you know be declared be declared a um, uh, a terrorist group. So. Um, so basically, this, this uh, clamoring for democracy was, as, as I think democracy generally is, an assault on uh, popular collective memory. It, it was a movement for social amnesia, to forget all of the ways that we've struggled, not just in the last decades or the last centuries, but in, in like the, the, the months immediately prior to that, and to, to adopt demands that really have nothing to say about, about what's, actually, um, what's actually going on. Mm. Fortunately, in a few cities, including Barcelona, the people of Real Democracy now completely lost control of, of their little monster, and, and it became a really wonderful opportunity to have debates, to look at different ways of, um, of organizing ourselves. Uh, I guess I'll, there's so many more things to say, but I'll just close up by talking about two different views of... Um, of decentralization. At a certain point, people started saying, we need to de decentralize this, sort of like the proposal that I mentioned that, that came from the subcommittee of the whatever committee. Um, and and at a certain point, it, it was interesting to see how quickly these proponents of direct democracy uh, co-opted uh, that language um, 
our, uh, uh, our our language of decentralization and, and once they realized that the, the winds were, were shifting they're like yes we need to decentralize this we need to go to the neighborhood assemblies but their idea was not actually to decentralize but to spread centralism everywhere to set up uh, one too many uh, Plaza Catalunya's in, in every single neighborhood assembly using the same structures using the sort of uh, uh, committee philosophy where we're uh, one social organization we will subdivide our tasks into these, these different um, um, thematic committees, rather than recognizing that this is a heterogeneous space, we'll never come to an agreement on anything. Uh, this is good. This is one of our strengths. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so within the neighborhood assemblies, you saw that conflict. Some neighborhood assemblies, especially the ones that did not exist before the 15th of May, were, were exact replicas in smaller scale of uh, the Plaza Catalunya occupation. And not coincidentally, I think they, they tended to, to reproduce very reformist uh, social democratic discourses, lacking of content, uh, generally being in favor of pacifism and all the rest. And then other assemblies that allowed themselves to be spaces of encounter, spaces of debate, uh, admittedly heterogeneous spaces in which conflicts were, were allowed and welcomed, um, tended to be more radical, tended to last longer, tended to be better at solidarity when members got arrested, for example, in subsequent general strikes. Um, so in a way, I want to argue that this is uh, maybe an exaggeration, but I hope a useful one. These uh, direct democratic movements that are appearing in many different places are in a lot of ways um, an attempt to get people to, to recuperate uh, our struggles, to, to find a common ground between ourselves and our rulers and our exploiters. Uh, and, and the values of democracy uh, are, above all, a way to to convince ourselves to, to discipline uh, uh, our own rage, discipline our own struggles, so that these struggles don't learn, so that they don't talk about destroying capitalism, destroying state, uh, the state, uh, destroying colonialism, and, and creating something um, um, wholly, wholly new. And I, I wouldn't limit that just to assemblies, even though we're focusing here on assemblies. I think all of these different spaces also face the danger of recuperation. The general strikes that we're facing with, we've had to fight a lot in our participation in those general strikes uh, against the labor unions that are trying to recuperate them. Another comment, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, and then also even in, in these completely independent actions like uh, clandestine attacks against the system, uh, those are of course much more resistant to recuperation, but they constantly face the danger of being isolated by the media, uh, uh, by the politicians and turn into things that are not supposed to have meaning for the rest of us. This is just something that these crazy criminal anarchists do and it's not something that everybody should be doing, going out at night or in broad daylight uh, with spray paint, with gasoline, with hammers, whatever, to destroy the infrastructure that, that enables uh, our control. All of these spaces need to be fought for continuously to keep them on the one hand from being isolated and made meaningless for others so that they can't communicate and on the other hand to keep them from being co-opted, recuperated, turned into ways to uh, to rejuvenate uh, the capitalist system. Thanks, sorry for talking so long. Okay, so now be before we go to the, to the discussion, I will just uh, take a couple of minutes. Uh, so I'm in the role of discussion, but also I have to kind of present the situation in, uh, in Slovenia. So I will try to kind of highlight uh, maybe some key points that were addressed and refer them to the situation and uh, struggles and uh, the discussion about self-organization in, in Slovenia. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, the first important uh, uh, issue is that uh, of course, the, the struggles are showing that uh, there is a crisis of representative democracy. So the, the institutions of representative democracy, so the, of the political representation or interest representation, do not adre address social needs, right? So that's why there is discussion about uh, uh, self uh, self organization, about assemblies, and so forth, and also. Um, for example, uh, what is approached to those movements is that they do not have uh, demands, but this is, can be also understood as realism, political realism, because there is no institution you can address those, um, those demands to. And basically being without the demands is kind of a power. So I will refer to, this, uh, to what happened in Slovenia. 
So last uh, fall, uprising started, and for example, the uprising in Maribor, which was really uh, strong, every fifth person living in this city came to the street, was basically without specific demands. The only demand was that mayor goes, that everyone goes. All corrupted politicians, political class goes. And until it was without demands, it was not articulated as a civil society movement, it was really strong because the people in power were really scared of them. So this is the first point, and I think that uh, this is something that, uh, that brought, us, brought us together here. And also, um, as you said, so it's not something that happens in a, in a social vacuum. Now, for example, in Slovenia, before the uprisings from 2007, 2008, we could see that uh, workers and social struggles are organizing themselves in a form of horizontality, uh, assemblies, direct democracy. For example, there were wildcat strikes, really important wildcat strikes that, sta that started in 2007, uh, 2008 uh, with pickets taking place for all week and of course when people do tickets, when they block for example the entrance to the port of copper you know they have to ap uh, apprentice in the direct democracy, you know how to take the decisions together because this is what gives them power and not the uh, union representatives you know that have dialogue with the, with the state and the, and the owners of the company. So this is, this is basically the first point I would like to stress. Then the second point I think uh, that was mentioned several times is heterogeneity and how, uh, and plurality, and how those uh, experiments of uh, new form of democ democracy are addressing those problems. Because we have, you know, the plural political composition and social composition. In those, in those movements. And of course the question of uh, decision making becomes really important. And for example, a lot of things were said about bureaucratization of the processes. Now we're said about how sovereign uh, power is imposed, uh, uh, you know, to, to this. So I'll just talk about the experience of the 50-no movement in Slovenia, which is occupation in front of the um, at, uh, in, on the, of the square in front of the uh, stock exchange in Ljubljana. So what this movement did, uh, it adopted a new form of decision making, uh, which was so-called democracy of direct action. So the assembly, general assembly, functioned just as a space of encounter that did not take the decisions, but uh, was just kind of trying to uh, uh, to achieve something like active consensus, but that, that does not need, you know, to in a way englobe everyone there. So the organization of the of the space was that you had uh, workshops uh, in which people organized themselves upon their struggles, you know, and they decided about the actions, and then they just shared their analysis and their uh, goals and, you know, their project on the General Assembly. And it was just kind of, you know, sedimentation of the, of the, of the, of the consensus, you know? So there was no uh, unifying. And this was, again, you know, because this was something that was not um, established in a social vacuum, it has uh, kind of, you know, a history, the history of, uh, of Slovenia, of the breakaway of Yugoslavia, and of nationalism, where direct democracy is often a uh, dictatorship of majority <laughs> over the minorities. No? For example, in Slovenia you had in the past referendums, so, you know, like institutional form of direct democracy, that uh, uh, at the end uh, denied the rights to minorities like in the case of erased or in the case of, uh, of single women and so forth. No? So for the activists uh, that, uh, I mean people that occupied this, uh, this place and then become, became activists, this is really important, you know, so that's why uh, uh, they gave uh, uh, the way for the minoritarian uh, articulations, political articulations. So this is ex exactly what you were talking about. No? But of course, interesting with the, with the occupation of the square uh, in front of the stock exchange was that it was comprised of the people that did not only defend the public sector from the privatization, but were at the same time critical against you know, disciplinarity and normalization practice in the existing public welfare. 
So people that fight against institutionalization for the institutionalization, for example, of uh, uh, psychiatrists, no? uh, psychiatric hospitals. Uh, people that are not uh, um, satisfied with the way uh, that knowledge is produced on the universities, in the public university, you know, so they want to produce knowledge differently. So for this reason, it was kind of, you know, uh, minoritarian drive uh, in this in this uh, occupation. Then uh, this, the another thing. Uh, when we talk about those assemblies and, uh, and occupation and so forth, so they tend to reproduce uh, social totality. And it's extremely important, you know, to uh, see that there is fight against this reproduction uh, that is related to how nation state is, was established. You know, what happened, for example, in the, in the, in the Gezi Park. No? Uh, because uh, what people today, in a way, want is kind of a general alternative, right? It's not the just uh, like civil society movements, you know, that uh, are one issue groups, you know, that uh, fight for one issue. But what is now at stake is basically a revolution. So this means, you know, how to reconstruct social uh, social totality differently, not state-based and not capital-based, right? So this, I think, is also something that was reflected in the in the movements in Slovenia, for example, in this occupation, and with the uprising that started in the last fall, uh, we could see that uh, this drive for the uh, uh, for this uh, reproduction of social totality can be also uh, problematic. No, problematic in the sense that people started to, you know, kind of produce. Uh, generalizations no, about the nation, about the fate of the nation, and so forth. So, for example, what was the uh, big issue in the uprisings was how to prevent uprisings to become centralized, how to prevent that there is a you know, central stage in which you have speakers you know, that speak on behalf of, of everyone or on, on behalf of this you know, abstract general, general interest uh, in the society. Um, then another thing uh, that is also important and was stressed here is the question of repression. But repression, you know, happens exactly when uh, the state power tries to prevent process of, uh, process of, of self-organization. So it's a part of the counterinsurgent strategy, but it's not the only one. The second one is how are you going to make out of those new experiments of uh, whatever, horizontal, uh, uh, direct democracy and so forth, how are you going to make civil society out of this? So how are you going to restore the link between the society and the state that is basically broken? Hmm? Uh, so uh, for example in Slovenia with the uprisings what happened is that all media started with the campaign, you know, like uh, uh, demanding people going to uprising to establish political party. <laughs> you know, and soon they managed to turn debate into debate of the new political party of the uprisings. So, you know, the question of institutionalization of the uprisings, of those, uh, or social upheavals and so forth, became really, really important. Um, then, um, uh, one difference I spotted also is the uh, difference between self-organization based upon specific goals and self-organization that has more to do with kind of moral outrage, you know, because of what happened. So, for example, Occupy, it was kind of moral outrage, but then, you know, it started to be also kind of operationalization of the concrete political struggles and processes. And then you have, of course, the specific goals of the movements like running the factory, you know, which is also, for example, now the big issue in Slovenia because with the crisis that is hitting hard Slovenia, so actually the process of expropriation, you know, hit hard Slovenia, there are people thinking about, you know, taking over factory. And so this is something, something that is new. And of course, the question of how are you going to generate power to take over factory or to take over faculty, or I don't know what, is crucial. And this power is something that is given by the 
democracy, right? More than the process of decision making is democratic, more power you is that you have, no? Because you have no other source of uh, source of power, no? So for this reason, of course, uh, uh, the resonance of those different experience is kind of uh, is kind of uh, crucial. But uh, then the question is also that you were talking about, no? How to then generalize in a way those particular uh, uh, instances of uh, self-organization, uh, you know? Um, this deciding in general assemblies uh, assemblies and so forth so i would just conclude with you know it's kind of uh, apprenticeship so we learn okay there are a lot of problems <laughs> i agree with you uh, we saw a lot of uh, things happen that we don't like for example also in those uprising we saw how you know the the power the the, the social power that people discovered uh, was uh, sacrificed, you know, for kind of uh, political goals. And I would be also critical toward the existing political groups. Because what happened in Slovenia is, you know, that you had kind of a fetishization of the self-organization, you know? So, for example, when there were uh, uprisings in, uh, a, let's call it, province of Slovenia, okay, which were really uh, strong moment with uh, confrontation, mass confrontation with police and so forth, people that were politically organized, you know, and cherish idea of self-organization started to talk about, wow, now we have to organize assemblies. So people will come to assemblies, you know, and we will discuss. But people didn't want to have assemblies. They wanted to fight. They wanted to go in the street, you know, and they wanted to express their anger, they wanted to express their indignation, and they wanted to fight. And the biggest problem was to explain to people, look, if you have riots, you have self-organization in it. You know, this is also instance of you don't need anarchists in order to then organize assembly. Right? I mean, people, when they fight the power, you know, they also have capacity to produce alternative norms. It's not because in, in Slovenia, what happens is that uprisings were something, you know, that, that happened outside of political milieus, outside of activists. It was kind of frustrating, you know. I mean, we have copyright on it. How come that these kids in Maribor do the riots? I mean, we as anarchists, we, we're supposed to do the riots. You know? So if they do the riots, we'll do the assemblies. And this is, this is something, well, it, has, it has practical, but this is a, a practical problem. The practical problem is that in, uh, on the 3rd of December in Maribor, 120 people, mainly kids, were arrested by the police, which is a lot. 120, there were like 20,000 people on the street. 28 were preventively detained for a month and now are now on the courts, you know? So there are court processes uh, against them. Seven of them in the month of September were sentenced to seven months of prison. You know, like being part in the, uh, of the group that prevented the uh, uh, action of police, something like this. Right? And the problem in Slovenia is that no one was really, I mean concretely, Solidar with them. That was the problem, right? Because you have this fetishization of self, uh, of uh, of uh, uh, self-organization, right? And when self-organization happens, you know, and self-organization happens on the streets, happens when, for example, police tries to disperse the crowd, and people have to fight, you know, because otherwise you're beaten, you're arrested, and so forth. This is also the form of self-organization that we have to study and we have to build. A political project upon. It's not just you know something that comes from uh, from the glorious past of the leftist of the leftist movements. So I don't know if there is something uh, more to say. Um, yes, there is another f uh, another f uh, thing that was mentioned: the problem of existing institutions. For example, of interest representation like unions. Can they be you know part of this struggle? Or not. This is also kind of a big issue and something that uh, that should be that should be uh, that should be discussed. So this is from my from my part to have more time for the discussion. So I open the floor uh, for the discussion, more or less self-organized, <laughs> with a little bureaucratic <laughs> uh, element.
the bill lawyer says that's fine for six months, and then it doesn't work. So I'd like the panel's opinion on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that a mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Say there's a microphone. Okay, uh, so uh, what uh, do we think, probably all of us, about leaderless movements? Can it really work? Hmm? After six months. <laughs> I like the deadline. <laughs> We've got the mic. I mean, I maybe we don't need to answer every question, but people can start yeah, talking, yeah, yes. right? Yeah. We right. spoke a lot. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. Very good. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, uh, bring up an issue that uh, was brought to my attention yesterday. I received a letter that was addressed to the whole conference, but I'm not sure whether all of you got it. And um, it was a letter from 16... Uh, people who had been involved with the Oakland uh, commune, the open Oakland Occupy. And uh, it, it was a, a letter that was, um, I, I thought it would be really useful to bring it up. And also I would like to hear if, if um, you had received the letter, Jasper. Yeah, I received it. Okay. Uh, and um, I just, uh, there were two points. Um, it was a, a long letter, but there were two major points. One point was that uh, the account of the Oakland Occupy uh, movement that uh, was being represented here at the conference was very one-sided. And that the, so that was the view. Okay, that was one, one criticism. And the, the other criticism was uh, really addressed to the conference as a whole, uh, which basically said that um, the People who are being invited to the conference generally come from a particular type of stratum in the movement, and that, in fact, uh, it's a stratum both uh, connected up with uh, academe, uh, having a certain racial and um, class uh, background and so on, that uh, it, it's really important that these conferences that we have bring together the whole movement and uh, the the, um, uh, the 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 present conference, for all its values, which I think we're we're all appreciating, um, uh, needs to uh, attend to these issues uh, in a practical way, and uh, so these two points I think are really important. Then I'd be interested to hear the conference views, but also your views, Jasper. So let's, uh, let's take another one and then we will... Uh, yeah, that's the order of questioning. Okay. Because who's who and who's appointed by who and who has agreed upon uh, sending who to where, but what, I don't know. What about the commission? <laughs> well, can I just can I can I just say one thing, which is to say that I agree, and and I think that you know, yeah, I, I think I agree with the criticism of the uh, of this letter that this is a you know that this that this conference doesn't represent everybody that's in a movement uh, that's in these movements, and it's not a um, you know it's not it's not a situation where the movements themselves decided who to who to send. It was essentially um, a few people. Picked their contacts and 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 created a, 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 a you know a conference out of that and um, you know that that has certain limitations and and I think that the criticism of that is very right and it would be great to have a conference that was organized in a completely different way and I'm happy to talk with you um, you know and uh, about it in more detail. Fortunately, my other comrades from Oakland are here and they're willing to talk with you about it too.
Yeah, I ju just wanted to say I also agreed. I'm from Occupy Amsterdam. We've been camping here for five months. Yesterday, this convention started with there's no uprising in the Netherlands. And we haven't also, as an Occupy, you know, there's still some context left. Let's, let's at least invite some of the people also from, hey, we're in Amsterdam. So that's a little bit the same conclusion came to a lot of people I've spoken to. Hi, so I want to get back the discussion to the panel. Uh, first of all, I'm very glad that Spanish anarchism do exist because uh, today uh, I've been listening uh, how we can reform European Union to become more democratic. So, uh, so thank you, Peter. <laughs> and um, what I want to say is about the assemblies. Um, so Peter made a very nice criticism about what was happening on the assemblies. And uh, Dimitris described uh, how their assemblies working. And um, I want to... I want to just um, I want to just say what I think is is the difference between the two assemblies, the one that didn't work and the one that did work. So uh, the assemblies that we describe on the um, on the squares, they are based on political demands, and people usually disagree in politics, and that is what democracy and the parties have learned us to do. They have learned us to. Um, gather according to our political uh, beliefs, and that will create tension. But if you gather and you create an assembly because you have a common goal, which is your work and your family and your place, then that assembly starts to work correct. And there is no more tension, there is no more um, struggle, but there is uh, struggle, I mean, between the people in, inside the, the, the assembly. But there is agreement and there is some movement. So maybe we should start thinking about why somebody in this conference called activist and what is this assembly that we are talking about and what is the square. Maybe we should become more like uh, organizing and creating assemblies on our working environments and on our, in our own land. So that was what I understand the two differences between if I could jump in just really quick. Um, maybe, maybe now we take answers. Yeah, jump. <laughs> that, that was the whole point. <laughs> First question, because it all comes back to leaderless groups. If you start with that, then we can do critique on what hasn't happened. But we can never finish that. I was thinking of also about you know, addressing that, if, if I can still jump. Um, what, one thing, like on the one hand, the, the assembly in Plaza Catalunya was was a total disaster, and on the other hand, it was it was brilliant, uh, depending on what what goals you you ascribe to it as a, a place to meet people, to form relations that still exist today. Uh, it was great as a decision making place. It was horrible, and it's interesting because a lot of people who were there have experience in assemblies like the factory assembly, for example, maybe a social center or a newspaper, some kind of project where you need uh, certain results, you need to to, to to carry out a certain coordinated activity so people had that experience and I think that experience is really um really important it shouldn't be it shouldn't be minimized that we also need this experience of, of self-organization although those assemblies tend to be smaller whether it's the 90 people of the factory or, or like 15 people who run our social center that's extremely important and so it is understandable that lots of people who did not have that experience looked for it in that in that uh, huge assembly even though it wasn't uh, the best the best place for it uh, as far as like the six months of, of self-organization uh, definitely the case in, in Barcelona that people came to the streets uh, um, fed up, really maybe starting to dream of a far-reaching change, but having no idea of what that actually looked like, what would be involved. Most of the people who started participating in the 15th of May movement thought that nonviolence would would work. They were quickly uh, disabused of that notion. Um, uh, people thought that revolution would simply meant what it's what it's meant in like the color revolutions, for example, where a bunch of people take the streets and then like power appears to fall and then a new power rises up and then the media, the television cameras are no longer there, so no one sees that actually what's replaced it is pretty much exactly the same as what was there before, and everyone who was participating in that so-called revolution is now extremely um, 
uh, pissed off about what they what they just won. Um, so. Uh, I, and I wouldn't really trust uh, Bill Moyers as a, as a commentator on, on revolution uh, myself, um, but I think basically we've lost our history of that, that we've been struggling for, for hundreds of years, that struggle is not an easy thing, to quote Mark Barnsley, that's why they call it struggle. Um, and so we can't expect to win in six months and we need to change our definition of winning. Winning is not getting better wages, it's not getting new politicians, it's not changing the law, it's destroying the system in which everything is owned by a few in which everything has owners, uh, in, in which we don't participate in the organization of our own lives, in which uh, we're, we're, we're governed uh, and creating something wholly new. That's something that will take uh, generations. Um. Okay, so are there uh, answers to the questions that you posed until now? Maybe I can shortly say, yes, I do believe that leaderless organizations can succeed, but of course it doesn't... Uh, is it better? Yeah. Yes, um, but it, it does require a lot of organization and structure. It, um, and in relation to what you were saying, um, I don't know, what I saw uh, coming out of the assemblies um, in the context of Gezi was that um, like against the temporariness, against the bureaucratization or hierarchization of um, the assemblies, um, like smaller working groups and uh, like lo localizing um, localizing the assemblies more and more and um, like creating thematic working groups focusing on different issues and establishing connections between these different groups um, is kind of an antidote to that those kind of problems okay. so maybe just uh, so maybe just about the uh, um, because this is a, this is a good can I speak to the, the question no? Yeah, sure. <laughs> but first I will, okay? Then, then, okay. okay. <laughs> because I, will, I would like to answer this one about the assemblies on the working place. I mean, just with what really happened. In Maribor, every fifth person that lives in this town was on the street protesting against the mayor and municipality government because they established the dense network of the raiders that controlled the speed in the city. Then people try to, you know, like reproduce the event of the uprising. So they, they did like workers uprising and like 100 people came. So what people showed in Maribor is that all cities, their working place, you know. I mean, also, you know, we have to understand that the destitution that happened, you know, the restructuration of economy and all this. So I wouldn't say, you know, that uh, uh, taking the, the streets is less important than taking the workplace. Often taking the streets means to take the, uh, the workplace today. Well, I mean, just the question of, uh, you know, whether leaderless revolution can work. Um, I, I think, you know, I think the world has already decided that, um, decided that kind of, uh, you know, party-led or personality-led um, movements or revolutions are not going to happen. We haven't seen a single, we haven't seen a single moment like that, and that indicates that we're in the midst of some kind of epical change. So we can wish that we inhabit another world, but I think it's probably better to look at the one that we do inhabit, um, in which people do kind of organize, uh, for better or worse, horizontally. Um, I don't think the real problem is 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 the existence of, of leaders. I think the real problem, as I tried to indicate, and I think that Peter did as well, is that power actually now does not adhere in the leaders. It doesn't adhere in the head of the movement. And you can decapitate the head, but there's still kind of domination which suffuses every kind of node and point of our society. And this is what I would kind of say to the talk we got yesterday about the network. The network is, you know, the hierarchy. It is domination, which exists at, you know, in its basic kind of structure. And so the question is not one for me of the form of whether we have leaders or not. That's a kind of empty scholastic debate which history has decided already. The, the question is the content and is what we're going to do um, with the kind of form and the mobilizations that we have. So. Can be short. So yes, very short. Sure. Yes, yes. Sorry. It's just uh, I would also about the issue of uh, leadership. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, it's really, it's for me, it's a problem of what, what we define as leadership. Uh, if, uh, because in any struggle you see that some people become more prominent 
And I can see it on a very small scale on the struggle of uh, Viome itself, that some of the workers who are more eloquent, who are more knowledgeable about some things, who are more experienced in social struggles because they have participated before, get more to the forefront. So if you look at them from the outside, they appear as the leaders of this struggle. And for me, there's no problem in that. It's not all that all the workers can give the same kind of speech or can uh, even talk at all before an audience, even if they talk in their own assemblies. They all talk. I've been at their assemblies. There's not one worker who doesn't talk, but it's a different thing to talk to people you don't know. So you get the, the appearance of having leaders, because it's usually the same four or five workers who speak to people who are bringing the struggle out, outwards. But the point is, what kind of leaders are they? And basically, they are leaders who are being controlled by their assembly. The assembly decides is what's being done, and they, because of the, the, the role they are playing, show it to the outside. It's not and you, know, you, you could say that because of their struggle, their opinion is maybe evaluated highly in the assembly, so if they have an opinion of something, uh, workers will agree, but that's not a kind of leadership that's imposed. It's a kind of leadership that comes through the participation of the struggle itself. So, yes, I believe that leadership, leaderless, struggle, leaderless struggles are possible if uh, by saying leaderless, we mean that you don't have leaders who are just planted uh, from the outside and can't be questioned, can't be uh, thrown over, can't be replaced. If we talk about struggles where people, some of the people be more prominent because of the capabilities of the position, I have no problem with that as long as I can control them, as long as I can say as I can state my own opinions, and everyone can do that, not just me, of course. And uh, in the end, when they are not irreplaceable. Um, can I? Um, where I come from, uh, I think we have an example that for the past almost 30 years, uh, a leaderless movement that has led into uh, independent communities that is still growing and is still getting stronger uh, uh, is so I mean I'm just I guess inviting you to look at this and I know most of you maybe have heard of them but just to bring it as an example I'm from Mexico and I'm talking about the Zapatistas communities so that's all it's been almost 30 years I'm counting Hi, um, I'm. Uh, I have um, uh, sort of like during the talks, I was um, especially about the assemblies. Um, I was uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, f feeling that there is not a parallel uh, discussion, like uh, a description uh, of the assembly together with the occupation of the square. Basically, the the, the the occupation of the square becomes sort of like a symbol of action and the assembly becomes a symbol of non-action. And maybe, perhaps, these stories should be in a parallel, uh, because both are affecting each other. It's not, it's not the assembly separate from the occupation. Uh, as far as, uh, as I have experienced, uh, occupation happened through the assemblies. It didn't happen before. So um, it's sort of like the... Um, the, uh, a narrative of assembly as becoming a body of decision is the same as the occupation becomes a symbol of action and stacks into that space. And then it's not even able to move and to do anything else except being protective on that particular spot. So maybe um, a discussion about how like bureaucratized the assembly becomes is also how symbolized becomes a spot <laughs> where the fight is concentrated. Although we could we could de you know deconstruct both of them at the same time, uh, the way that you described uh, assembly uh, taking a certain form and becoming like a, this kind of very close system and central. 
At the same time, there was a huge experience of, um, you know, especially in New York, this kind of symbolic, heavily symbolic spot of like uh, Zuccotti Park, preventing any other action or occupations happening throughout the city, although there was a huge capacity of people and numbers of people that they were there to do actions and do certain things, but they were stuck into, into this, this spot, this space. So I think that um, we need to like create a parallel uh, narrative and a parallel criticism. And then this, the other question I want to do um, is, uh, the question I want to make is uh, basically uh, in terms of the syndicalism, um, the, the, um, uh, what was uh, what was what was and how uh, the body of the workers uh, were able to abandon the traditional syndicalist uh, body? Because in terms of the occupation in Earth, for example, uh, which I've been I, I I was there and I was extremely frustrated. Um, there was a huge barrier and um, um, uh, how can I say uh, volatile uh, wall of the syndicalist uh, organizations to create uh, or to allow the workers to have their own assembly. At the same time, they were provocating a solidarity, a solidarity, solidarity assembly that was happening outside the factory. And basically, it prevented like this movement, this, this amazing moment to expand and become something strong for the whole uh, city and, uh, and Greece. Uh, I mean, in the anarchist tradition, there is this kind of story that we're going to take the media and we're going to like, uh, uh, you know, transmit our own messages and transmit what we what we want to, to, to say. There was an opportunity there and it was gone because there were so many barri barriers with syndicalists and this like, hold on to tradition and to the union uh, formation. And I really want to hear about your thoughts about that and your tactics and the way you experience it. Can we take another two questions when we go first? The last one there, two, three, okay. Yeah, we can stay here and do this. It's um, yeah, so I wanted to just say, like, I really appreciated the interventions that both Jasper uh, and Peter made into this, like, conversation around democracy and consensus and whatever, because I think it's super problematic. Um, and I think I appreciated both of them because they weren't just, like, out and out rejecting them. They were both, like, looking at them from a strategic or tactical point of view. And I think that's more useful on some level. Um, and I think one of the, the one of the things that you start to evaluate things based upon from that perspective is less about like um, does it work or does it not work as as Peter already said, but like what is its function? Like what are it, the effects that it generates? And I think, for example, like this question of leaders is not important, but the question of like uh, neutralization and pacification is. And I think this way, like the question should be more about control and less about leaders and l more about activity and, and passivity and less about like hierarchy or whatever. Because like, I don't care if some people are prominent, if what they're prominently doing is like inspiring people to act on their own and like go and wreck the people who are otherwise ruining their lives, you know, if they're bringing heat to their oppressors and that's the inspiration that leaders are having, then great. I don't care. Like that's because the effect they're generating is activity, is like intensification of a situation. And that's what matters, I think, more than this like abstract formal like Aristotelian like here's a form of government. What are it, what does it look like? What is its pure form? Like I don't care. Um, but I wanted to like so I wanted to say that as a remark and then I wanted to like sort of follow up with a question that was partly um, implied by Peter's talk, but I wanted to hear more about it. Like, at some point he said something like, we need to not legitimate the central point in these movements, like the actually the center, the, the assembly or whatever. But I think that uh, that actually brings up a bigger question regarding like legitimacy and legitimation. 
um, in movements as a whole. And there is still this attempt all the way through Occupy to like try and construct itself as like a legitimate, like uh, deserving kind of innocent subject and to frame the police as like constantly violating us for no good reason or something like this. And I think like as some criticisms have been recently made by like the Lies Journal and others, I think there's like a way in which that still frames things in terms of legitimacy. And I wonder like what people's ideas are to like get out of that framework like completely. Because I think democracy is just one more instance of like saying like, well, we have the right to decide and then other people don't. And it's still within this framework of like authorization and anything that's not authorized by the con consensus or whatever is illegitimate or whatever. And I think you're still within a kind of juridical framework that's really problematic, so. I want to make a, uh, go on two points. First was the question about leaders. I think it's obvious that in the years of struggle we have behind us, no leader figures appeared. It's not like the 60s that you have a Martin Luther King, you have a Malcolm X, you have a Rudy Dutschke, you have a Daniel Cohn Bendit. We don't have this, and I think that's a good thing. But leadership is, I think, something different. Maybe we can talk about leadership as a mechanism that everyone can learn, that we should be aware that people should learn them. For example, moderation, for me, is the main leadership skill we need today in our struggles. How do you moderate the assembly? How do you and organize some resources? And not everyone can moderate and organize resources as, as, uh, uh, as everyone else. So there are leadership skills. Uh, that we should be aware to to uh, to to bring to as much as people as we can. I want to counterpart a little what the comrade from Barcelona was saying in the last uh, point. That um, it, it, for me it was too much focusing on destruction. If you talk about the revolt, of course a revolt is destruction. Um, you, we have to destroy the system of oppression. We have to destroy culture of, uh, of capitalism, and so on and so on. But if you, on the same time, don't develop something new, you will lose the uprising. And I think we should be careful of thinking about uprisings. We will win at any case. You know, there is some kind of this thinking. Yes, there are experienced people doing. There are things going on everyday struggle. This is what we are winning at, at any case. But revolts are not going to win at any case. I mean, if you look at the Egypt revolution, there was this destruction of the police state. At the same time, there was Tahrir Square as this is the new Egypt. And if you look, for example, to London, to Tottenham, there was a destruction, but there was no new Britain. And what happened was that reactionary forces after this time get much more stronger than before. So um, if we are talking about from streets to neighborhood to factories, I think this should be, this is exactly this debate. How do we develop the new? And um, the, the last point I want to make, the, 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 the building of the new is, uh, should be more than just taking over the ruins of capitalism. I mean, the, the experiences we have from Greece are impressive. They are impressive how people can organize these abandoned factories. But this is kind of the ruins of capitalism. Is it the end of our, our project? Taking over the ruins? We want, do we want to build the new world on ruins? I don't think that's enough. I want to occupy Apple. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. No. Um, my my question to uh, Island mainly. Um, so I want to go back to Turkey briefly, um, in the sense that when we're talking about um, horizontal form of organising, it's often um, put in the framework of the sort of occupy 99%. But with Turkey, it was kind of much more sort of identity, identity politics with, you know, there's the Kurds, there's the Alevi, there's the Sunni, there's the Kemalists and stuff. And that thing of what you were talking about, the solidarity that went across that, you know, and how the Gezi resistance broke that. And I was wondering what you think if, like, if, if maybe partly that kind of like that more far-reaching solidarity with different groups which were previously not engaged with each other, do you think the sort of the way it was organised, the horizontal way of organising, as you described the forums and stuff, it was new for, it was new in Turkey this this way of thing, the fact that you know the, there was no political parties actually within the park and they were all in Taksim Square itself and that kind of thing. And so, do you think there's a relationship between how that solidarity reached further, further into other groups, you know? and actually how it was horizontally organized and there was no leadership. 
with the sort of traditional leftist parties? Yeah, certainly. Like be, because before the the relationship between um, these different uh, political stances, views, identities, whatever we call them, are always mediatized by um, external parties, like political parties or media. Or I mean, there are like stereotypical discourses that also, you know, um, like define the, the way people think about each other. And for the first time, at the horizontal way of organizing in the park, in the occupation, with the absence of media and the emergence of an alternative media, which was uh, broadcasting from the park by the people in the park, um, allowed it to um, realize for people that, um, hey, we're speaking the same language, or even though we don't, um, like there's a way to stand together. Or, I mean, also what's important is the um, like really ambitious um, like struggle of the feminists and LGBT people in the park, for instance, um, like erasing the sexist slogans from the walls or um, like just standing in front of the tent and talking to uh, soccer fans who are shouting um, like sexist slogans, basically. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. So, um, well, um, precisely because of this horizontal way of uh, unmediatized, non-mediatized way of relating to each other, um, these people um, like, could stand together. And in the forums, um, it, it continued that way. And just one more remark about um, like what's specific to Istanbul, maybe, is that the assemblies did not um, cause the occupation, but actually the assemblies started because of the yeah, lack of the symbolic center as the occupation. Uh, uh. I'd like to make the does it work question a little bit more concrete with respect to Viomax factory. Um, now the factory is in operation, but is it in a place to cover its expenses, pay its wages? And also, how do you, the companies that work together with you see you? Because an occupied factory does not work in a vacuum. It needs other companies to transport their products, to other companies to sell them, to, uh, to sell the raw uh, material to them. How is this relationship? And a last thing, how can we take a practical solidarity to, to this effort back to our country? So how can we support? No, no, it's, it's okay. Just, just, just go, just go. But he's just like, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, because um, the discussion about uh, assemblies had a lot of criticism. And uh, of course, um, it, it started, uh, let's say, with an outcome from uh, the comrade from uh, Auckland that uh, it shouldn't have a, a decision make. It, it shouldn't have decision making powers. Um, assemblies do control what smaller groups can do, and it shouldn't be about. So uh, I, I agree. Let's say that it shouldn't be about controlling. Assemblies should not be about controlling. And I don't think they are about controlling because smaller groups can do whatever they like. I don't think an assembly prohibits from smaller groups to do their own uh, action, let's say, their own activity. Now, to me, um, I don't see like uh, a value of a smaller group saying, no, I give up on the assembly. I don't want to uh, be part of it. Uh, I want to do my own thing. Uh, because I think the assembly uh, is, uh, it, it involves the society, it involves uh, the, the different um, parties of the society, and a smaller group, um, it's, it's a small part of it. So I don't see how it helps if a smaller group does something uh, that is separated from the society in this way. So um, I think the, uh, a sm smaller groups should uh, participate in assemblies and try to convey these messages and try to understand um, 
oh. what what uh, the other parties of the society think about certain things, um, and this is the self organization. This is the whole uh, uh, point of the self organization in a larger uh, scale. Let's say um, in in a big assembly, as you mentioned in uh, Barcelona, or in a smaller scale in a neighbor in neighbors. Let's say um, so. I believe this is the only way to to uh, go uh, towards a self-organized society, and uh, I think we should find a way to make this work, and to make a, a, dis a, a proper decision-making mechanism uh, in assemblies. Lipom, to Ergustasio. The factory is being uh, worked by ourselves. Uh, we, the workers, uh, work the factory. There are no bosses. This is the factory Uh, this happened because uh, the boss, as I told earlier, uh, just abandoned the factory with debts, uh, debts of the factory, and also debts to the workers. Εμείς ας οματίο συζητήσαμε και είπαμε ότι δεν θα μείνουν κι άλλοι άνεργοι να πάνε στο σπίτι τους να περιμένουνε το τέλος τους. Uh, we, as the assembly of the factories union, uh, decided, discussed, and decided that uh, we will not create uh, even more uh, unemployed people who will just go home and just wait for the end. The Orgostasio έβγαζε δομικά υλικά. Αυτή τη στιγμή εμείς βγάζουμε φυσικά προϊόντα, οικολογικά και για το περιβάλλον και σε χαμηλό κόστος για να μπορεί να το πάρει ο κάθε εργάτης. Uh, the factory used to produce uh, building materials. Now it's producing natural uh, cleaning products, uh, ecological, uh, friendly to the environment, uh, which are also cheap, and so that any uh, simple worker can is able to buy this product. Έχουμε μια γενική συνέλευση που ψηφίζουμε όλοι. Ενωμένοι. Δεν υπάρχει ούτε ένα πάνω ούτε ένα κάτω. We decide everything in our general assembly uh, with uh, where everyone has an equal vote and there is no one above or under us. Πληρωνόμαστε όλοι το ίδιο. Πιστεύουμε αυτό που κάνουμε. Γι' αυτό είμαστε και εκεί δυόμιση χρόνια. Uh, we are paid all the same wages and uh, we believe in what we do and that's why we're still here after two and a half years of struggle. First of all, we're interested in the fight and then we'll see if we'll get the money for the money. First of all, we are interested in winning this struggle and afterwards we'll see if we'll get uh, the big money. The fight that we give is generally ένα αγώνα που έχει γίνει και πιο παλιά και σε εργοστάσια όπω την Αργεντινή, το εργοστάσιο τη Ζανών. Το struggle που κάνουμε είναι ένα struggle που έχει γίνει και πιο παλιά, για παράδειγμα, στι φάκτριε τη Αργεντινή, όπω η Ζανών. Έρχονται πάρα πολλοί κόσμοι κάθε μέρα στο εργοστάσιο από παντού στι γενικέ μα συνελεύσει και ακούνε τι ακριβώ πράττουμε για να μπορέσουν και αυτοί να πάνε να πούνε στους δικούς τους τι ακριβώς μπορούν να κάνει ο καθένας για να κερδίσει την αξιοπρέπεια και τη δουλειά του. Every day we have visitors to the factory who are who who follow and participate in our general assemblies and so get a picture and get an idea of what we are doing in the factory so that they can bring that message back. Uh, to their own people, wherever they come from, uh, so that they can try and do something similar. Και μην ξεχνάμε ότι εμείς παράγαμε. Άρα μπορούμε να το δουλέψουμε το κάθε εργοστάσιο που υπάρχει μέσα τρόπος με τα μηχανήματα να κάνεις ό,τι θέλεις. 
and let's not forget that we were producing. So, uh, with the machines in the factory, we are able to do whatever we want. Όσο για το συνδικαστικό, συνδυαστικό κομμάτι που είπε η κοπελιά, ε, εμείς έχουμε τη γενική συνέλευση, πιστεύουμε σε αυτήν. Δεν υπάρχει κομμάτι το οποίο μπορεί να μας αλλάξει αυτό που κάνουμε, τον τρόπο που λειτουργούμε. Είμαστε αυτοί. Λειτουργούμε με τη γενική συνέλευση. Ο αγώνας μας είναι να το πιστεύουμε εμείς, να το πιστέψει ο κόσμος, να μεγαλώσει αγώνας, να γίνει ένας κρίκος που να μην κλείσει ποτέ. Uh, he said about the syndicalist. Ποιο? Μην το περίμενε να μεταφράσει. About the syndicalist part, uh, uh, we function with the General Assembly of the Union. Uh, I have to remember the whole train of what he was saying. Uh, we All the decisions are taken through the assembly and uh, there is no part inside of us that could make us to function otherwise. We had a question about how this happened. The part that you ask is very simple. There was no such thing for us. There was no such thing. We are a group with a general assembly that we decide all how to do it inside. Uh, about the question about how this happened that we don't have in the union of Vilma any bureaucrats is simply there never were any bureaucrats. The, from the beginning of this... <laughs> hmm. Well, I, I could say a few things. Basically, uh, well, one of the factors you could say uh, purely numerical factor is that's a small union. We are not talking, you know how the unions are in Greece. Uh, to say a few words, you have unions of factories, you have unions of sectors, you have unions of uh, uh, whole regions, you have uh, federations of unions, and then you have the general federations of workers of Greece, which is a, a, a huge uh, third level union that unites all unions and is of course extremely bureaucratic and basically an instrument of the government. Uh, I say that's because it's a difference from other countries like France or Turkey where you have many such unions. In Greece you have only one. Um, that being said, uh, the Union of Vilma is a union of the factory itself. It was founded in 2006. And it was founded because they had problems in the factory, the workers, and they didn't have uh, an official body that could uh, state their demands to the owners, to the, uh, the direction of the factory, and struggle for their demands. So, from the basic need of having an official uh, body that could represent them, they created the factory union. But we don't, we're not discussing about a factory of thousands of people, so it was natural that the function would go through an assembly. It was easy. If you may have that point in its favor, when you have a factory, if you read the stories about uh, the Russian Revolution of factories of 5,000 5, and 10,000 workers, it seems extremely difficult to make an assembly for such a factory. The Vyome was a small factory. So it had the numbers in its favor to make an assembly that could actually work. I have to go, I'm very sorry. Δεν είπε στην πράγμα το ότι τι είπες πριν ας πούμε ότι μίλησες ότι πρώτα να νοικήσουμε τον αγώνα και μετά θα σκεφτούμε να τα πολλά λεφτά. Και βέβαια όταν μετά φτάσαμε στα αγγλικά που είπε και λίγο διαφορετικά. 
αυτό που λέει στον Μαλή, ο Πανεπιστήμιο, με το Θεμελιώδη, τι ακριβώ εννοεί με το να αρχίσετε τον αγώνα και τι εννοεί με το πρόβλημα. Black humor. The big money is uh, black humor. <laughs> so I think I think we can uh, we can stop our discussion here because we are a bit tired already. There's going to be plenty. Could I say one thing the about there was a question about no no no. Let's, <laughs> no, no, no yes. I mean let's. We can do it with a glass of wine. Yeah, we can do it with a glass of wine. I agree with this because you know. Uh, apparently we are like uh, half a size now. Well, the factory workers say one thing about winning the whole struggle. It's when we have taken the whole of society into our hands and there is no more uh, uh, bosses, no more uh, uh, exploitation, and we all can live freely and just uh, express ourselves and live decent lives. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanna, I just wanna quickly say that this video was made.